Well, seven months later, I feel like I never left. Um, thank you all for coming out. And good morning. Welcome to this, the 68th General Assembly of Colorado. From up here, I see a Senate which is a remarkable collection of human diversity and talent. We serve in a Senate of women and men in nearly equal numbers. Women chair seven of the 11 standing committees. We are privileged to have three Latina members, the largest number ever to serve at the same time in the Colorado Senate. We have the honor of two members of the LGBT community. While this diversity would have been unimaginable to our parents, it is both natural and unremarkable to our children. I am proud to serve with all of you. I am humbled to be the President of the Senate. Today we need all of your talent and energy more than ever before. The challenges we face cannot be overstated. In 2001, the size of our general fund budget was about $6.6 billion. Nine years later, in 2010, the size of our general fund budget was again about $6.6 billion. It's not that the general fund didn't increase over the past nine years. It did. But as the state has experienced declining revenues caused by the recession, we closed budget shortfalls of over $4.2 billion back to 2001 levels. During the same nine-year period, we saw significant growth in our state's population. The recent census report shows that we grew by almost 17 percent, the ninth fastest in the nation. We have over 700,000 new Coloradans, including about 70,000 new students in our K-12 public schools, 35,000 new students in our institutions of higher education, 150,000 new people on our Medicaid rolls, and 2,500 new inmates in our prisons. Indeed, we are challenged to do more with less. Colorado's economy has fared better than some. Our unemployment rate is 8.6 percent, almost a full point below the national average. However, these numbers have very little meaning to the almost 230,000 people in our state who are looking for jobs but are still without work. And that's why this legislature will make the tough choices necessary to put Coloradans back to work, create jobs, and expand our economy. During each of the past three years, Democrats and Republicans alike have emphasized economic development and job growth as a cornerstone of their legislative agendas. We have both brought forward proposals that have helped in this regard. For example, in 2008, we assessed the needs for statewide broadband access, laying the foundation for a $100 million federal grant to create an affordable statewide broadband network that will provide underserved schools, libraries, colleges, and communities with high-speed Internet access. In 2009, we created the Job Growth Incentive Fund to provide a credit on payroll taxes for businesses that create new jobs in Colorado. And since then, companies like DaVita, Repower USA, and the Sierra Nevada Corp have located their businesses here, bringing hundreds of jobs with them. And in 2010, we put the capstone on the new energy economy by increasing the state's renewable energy standard and passing the Clean Air, Clean Jobs Act, further emphasizing our commitment to technology and innovation and creating an atmosphere where public-private partnerships, such as the one between NASA and the Colorado Association for Manufacturing and Technology, can thrive. Because of these pro proposals and others like them, Colorado is currently rated by Forbes.com as the fourth best state for fostering economic growth. CNBC ranked Colorado the third best state for business. And the American Legislative Exchange Council says Colorado's economic outlook is second best of the 50 states. While these are encouraging signs, everyone is frustrated by how slowly the economy is turning around. It can be compared to turning an aircraft carrier. It's a big ship and it takes a while to maneuver. As a former surface warfare, warfare officer, I can attest to that. It can take miles to turn a slow-moving aircraft carrier, but that only tells part of the story. Before you start the turn, you must first secure each aircraft aboard. 
modern carrier may carry up to 80 planes, and just one FA-18 Super Hornet costs taxpayers $57 million. So you better get it right. The time, care, and preparation taken before throwing the rudder over is more important, more difficult, and more time-consuming than the actual maneuver. The same is true of our economy. Our recovery will take time and will require advanced care and preparation. It's here that we have an opportunity. The quality of our work today will determine how fast we recover and the direction for our state for the next century and the area where we have the greatest potential for growth, both in human and economic capital, is in our educational system. Kelly Bruff, President and CEO of the Denver Metro Chamber of Commerce, recently said, we rely on our university system to grow our future workforce. They are the lifeblood of Colorado's knowledge-based economy. In a recent Denver Post op-ed, she also observed that over 60% of Denver's future jobs will require more than a high school diploma, and that a 1% increase in college graduation rates will return approximately $1.8 billion to Denver's economy. A recent analysis of the University of Colorado's economic impact on our state concluded that for every $1 of unrestricted general fund support that we provide the university, the university returns $40 to the Colorado economy. CU contributes $6.3 billion to the state's economy annually. CU is the fourth largest employer with some 26,000 employees and is responsible for another 30,000 jobs related to the university's endeavors. Similar statistics and projections hold true for every region of our state and each institution of higher education. For example, on the western slope, Mesa State College has an estimated impact of $125.3 million on the regional economy. When both direct and indirect spending is taken into account, the estimate expands to $225.6 million worth of economic activity. And in northern Colorado, Colorado State University, Front Range Community College, University of Northern Colorado, and Ames Community College together employ more than 9,700 workers and provide an annual payroll in excess of $400 million a year. There's no question, there's no argument, and there's no doubt. Education equals jobs. An educated workforce attracts businesses, and a healthy business climate is the foundation for a high quality of life for every Coloradan. Colorado is quickly moving from a new energy economy to a knowledge-based economy, where a strong educational system is an economic imperative. As we head into a session where we are staring down the barrel of millions of dollars of cuts to K-12 and higher education, we must consciously prioritize education first as we consider every bill that comes before the legislature. Today, I designate the Knowledge-Based Economy Fund as Senate Bill 1. Senator Bob Bacon will be its prime sponsor, and it will, it will create an account to set funds aside throughout the session and dedicate them specifically to education funding. I challenge each of you I challenge each of you to view this session through the knowledge-based economy lens. If your goal is to shrink government, to eliminate programs and root out wasteful government spending, let me help you. Let me help you identify those programs that don't make sense, those functions of government that can be done more efficiently and less expensively, and let me help you redirect the funds currently being wasted to a higher cause, our knowledge-based economy. If your objective is to ensure Colorado's, go Colorado's government is an effective partner with the private sector, a partner that empowers the private sector, a partner that creates an environment where private industry flourishes and thrives, a partner that encourages businesses to locate and relocate here, creating jobs and opportunities for the future, then again, let me help you. Let's do it together. Let's do it together by finding resources in our budget to reduce cuts to our knowledge-based economy. In an economic climate where we will face enormous challenges, we must, we must fuel the knowledge-based economy with human capital that will help us turn the ship of state toward more prosperous times. 
I'm also often asked how we will move forward, especially in light of the recent changes in the balance of power here at the Capitol. My standard response is the more things change, the more they stay the same. Last session, the General Assembly considered 649 bills, passed 458 of them to the governor. Of those that passed, 36% had both Democratic and Republican prime sponsorships. 79% had bipartisan co-sponsorships. We demonstrated that we know how to work together, and that's exactly what the people of Colorado want us to do. This session, we have an opportunity to do more of the same. We have already established the Bipartisan Joint Select Committee on Redistricting. We have also we have opportunities to tackle health care reform as we consider health insurance exchanges, a requirement of the federal health care legislation, but also a recommendation that came out of the 208 Commission on Health Care Reform appointed by Republican Governor Bill Owens. We can also make bipartisan progress on constitutional reform, ending ballot initiative warfare while protecting the rights of Colorado's, Coloradans to petition their government, and cost recovery audits, ensuring we get what we inspect, not just what we expect from government agencies, is yet another area where we can work together. These are just a few areas that are ripe for bipartisan cooperation and success. There are many, many others it is our responsibility to focus our attention on these areas of common ground to get things done during this legislative session. It won't be easy, and we will make tough decisions, but the human spirit can power over adversity. As Margaret Mead said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. By acting collectively, we will triumph over formidable odds. This is no time to resist an answer because we don't like the messenger. This is no time to reject solutions because they come with a liberal or conservative label. It is no time for the personal prerogatives of partisan politics. It is time to restore the confidence of the people of Colorado that we can govern. It is time to embrace solutions tested by intellectual rigor and common sense, solutions crafted in compromise, solutions that benefit the well-being of our people. It is my hope that this General Assembly can act to make Colorado a better community for every section and sector of this great state, for every community of interest, and for every political philosophy. This is the hope of the people of Colorado. This is their direction, and these are their needs. We must do no less on their behalf. Thank you.